Hello and welcome to Kaos Live. We're coming to you from the Winter Enrichment Program, Synaptic Homeostasis Hypothesis. Can yes. you talk in more detail about that? Yes. Um, it's actually a very simple idea, is that uh, the reason why we need to sleep, uh, and we spend uh, up to a third of our entire life actually asleep, so it's a big chunk of our time, is because uh, during the day, we are always learning something new. It's not only when we go to a lecture. We are always confronted by an uh, evolving environment, and our brain has to adapt to that. And that requires our neurons and the connections among neurons to be modified and to strengthen. But um, that's a very costly process in terms of energy. And sleep is basically needed then to renormalize and to control that cost. So basically, really, it means that the more we use our brain, the more we learn every day, the more we need to sleep. And to do this process of renormalization, sleep is perfect because by definition, when we are asleep, we are disconnected from the environment. We are not slave of the here and now. And so this process can happen in a very efficient way, in a very global way, that allows the brain to renormalize many of these connections. That's why we think it's something that you cannot do when you are awake. It really requires the, uh, the sleep. But that's why also we call it uh, the price of plasticity, sleep is the price. Because being asleep is actually a very potentially dangerous condition. Because by definition, when we are asleep, we are less able to respond to something uh, potentially even little. And so if you think about it, there must be a very important reason why we still do sleep and we do it for such a long time. And we think that's the reason. And the reason is because this process of renormalization is so essential for then the next day for our brain to be ready to learn new things that we have to pay this price every day. So that's the general idea mm -hmm. that uh, is actually very simple. Is also, and that's uh, a great advantage, I think, of uh, scientific ideas, is testable. So you can prove it right or wrong, and that's what we have been trying to do. But as you hinted to, it's taken a long time, <laughs> more than 20 years. And the reason is because to measure how synapses are changing, which means basically we think when, when we learn during wake, at the end, the synapses, the connections among neurons get strengthened. So what you need to do is to prove that indeed the synaptic strength overall increases with wake and then renormalizes, decreases with sleep. But measuring this strength, especially in vivo, in a freely moving subject, including humans, is not trivial. And there is no a single way to do that. And that's why uh, you know, it's taking so, so long, because we are trying to use many different methods in many different subjects, uh, animal models. Also because we think that if this hypothesis and again, it's still an hypothesis, is correct. Uh, and so if this function of sleep is so basic, like renormalizing synaptic strength, it has to be true across phylogeny. So it cannot be just true in us, it has to be true also in mice, in flies, in all species that have been studied and have been proven to sleep. And so that's why we use many of these models. So there does seem to be some reason that sleep is essential, even though it seems to almost go against evolution because you are so vulnerable. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why, and um, I, I will mention in my lecture today, I was so amazed of finding at the Kaust Museum, and there is a description of the six necessities, essential things that we require, that the uh, physician has identified as fundamental for our health. And uh, among those six, uh, there is rest, which is for the muscle, mm. uh, and then there is sleep. Because indeed, the sleep is not simply rest, it's not simply immobility and quiescence. We can lay down on a sofa 
watch TV all day, our muscles will recover fatigue, but not our brain. So our brain really needs this process of going offline, despite the fact that it is potentially incredibly dangerous. And again, we do it for a third of our life, so there must be a reason. Otherwise, we think evolution would have found a way to do whatever that function is of sleep during wake. And you've already touched upon how we're always learning something when we're awake, our brains, and the energy toll this has. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about quite how great that toll is? It's very uh, large because, uh, you know, the brain is already an extremely expensive organ to run. Brain activity, neuronal activity is is as being calculated that anything from 60 to 70 to 80 percent of all the energy, the ATP in the brain, is used exactly to maintain synaptic activity. So to sustain these communications among neurons through synapses. The rest, which is a small minority, is to, you know, housekeeping other functions. But the really the, the core of all the energy is to sustain uh, synapses. And that's why we think it, it, it would be unsustainable. It's not the, because one, one, one uh, criticism, one question would be, well, I understand you learn f mainly through synaptic strengthening, but what's wrong with just keep going up and up and up and having, you know, across our lifespan, stronger and stronger synapses? Well, the wrong is it's unsustainable from an energetic point of view. That's one of the reasons. Another one is that, and this has been shown, eventually synapses will saturate. So, you know, they, they lose the ability to strengthen uh, any further. There are studies in people, in uh, animals, showing that, you know, if you force learning, uh, and then you don't leave any time out, uh, it's very difficult to learn something, again, new. And we all, as students, so in, have, have experienced that. And it's indeed because they saturate. So, and it seems, based on uh, a lot of evidence, that you know, this is not just a theoretical concept. It seems that you can get to this point of saturation, at least for one region of the brain that has been studied a lot, that is the cerebral cortex, quite uh, quickly. So across an, an, a day of learning, you can get very close to saturation. That's why you need to sleep, uh, uh, hopefully, every night. <laughs> and that's when this um, pruning of uh, synapse synapses takes place. So then how do we form enduring memories so that when we wake up, they're still in our brains, they're still, you know, accessible? Yeah, that's a very uh, difficult question and I don't have a, uh, you know, definitive answer. That's the, let's say, we now, I think we have a good evidence that indeed overall there is strengthening of many connections during wake and then weakening of many connections, most connections probably, during sleep. But you are absolutely right. Well, this is at the you know, basic level, but at the behavioral level, we know that sleep has all these advantages. After sleep, we can learn new things, but we can also remember, consolidate what we have learned the day before. We can integrate the old with the new, and very important, and this is one of the new areas of research, actually, in the sleep field, forgetting. There are a lot of trivial details every day that we better forget at the end because they are irrelevant. Sleep does all that. So how can this process of widespread synaptic renormalization accounts for all this? Learning, memory, forgetting, what is called the gist extraction. So at the end, you don't remember the little detail, but you remember the scheme, no? your body of knowledge. Well, again, the gap is still very, uh, very large, but we are starting to understand that the precise way neurons, for instance, are firing, are active during sleep, because neurons are active, it's not that they shut off during sleep, they are actually almost as active and firing and signaling as during wake, but they do it with a very specific 
pattern of activity that's crucial for this renormalization to happen. If you block that, which you can do genetically now, you don't have the renormalization. So that's at the electrophysiological level. At the molecular level, we are starting to identify precise, specific molecules that are really important to basically signal and tag some synapses that are the ones that you have used today, and those synapses are more likely to be protected from this process of uh, very widespread renormalization because those are the ones that today carry the most important signal that is what you have learned today. And so we are start to identify at the molecular level how could it happen that overall the system goes down and weakens in, in connections, but with very precise you know, differences depending on how exactly you have used your brain, your neurons, and your synapses today relative to uh, yesterday. Again, is at the beginning, but at least uh, there are, and this is really the last two years or so, a few studies that are pinpointing on how this could happen. It's not magic. So it's very reassuring and is a fantastic time actually to be in sleep research because the tools finally are available to try to bridge this huge gap between you know, what we know for sure sleep is doing at the behavioral level, at the cognitive level, and what now we are starting to understand at the very basic molecular uh, mic microscopic level. So what do you make of recent studies that have shown some links between poor quality sleep and brain changes uh, related to dementia? Well, it's all, you know, at the end, the dementia, it's what is affected indeed is the plasticity, is the synapses, because again, synapses are the bread and butter of how the brain works. So uh, the uh, inability, what we know for sure that at least some of the uh, uh, proteins and the, the accumulation of amyloids, for instance, mm -hmm. related to Alzheimer, happens with neuronal activity and with sleep deprivation, the accumulation of amyloid increases. And so sleep, from that point of view, helps to remove that toxic uh, you know, accumulation. Now, whether this is what, at the end, the, the, the only way sleep actually helps uh, we don't know. It probably actually works both ways, uh, but uh, it's not difficult to imagine a very strong connection between, uh, you know, the uh, issue of how sleep can help in renormalizing synapses and therefore in restoring plasticity, maintaining plasticity, and how instead in this neurodegenerative disease, it's probably not only Alzheimer, you can have a, a, a problem at the beginning or at the end of the circle, actually. So I read that you got into sleep science at, uh, in your first year at medical school. Correct. How did you know at such a young age that this was an area of specialism that you wanted to pursue? Well, I think a major uh, factor were, was where I studied. I studied medicine in Pisa, and Pisa is where Giuseppe Moruzzi, who uh, uh, discover the reticular activation system, so one of the systems in the brain that's fundamental to keep us awake. So in, in Pisa, there was a huge tradition in studying arousal states, sleep and wake, and I think uh, training in, uh, in a place with a big tradition and uh, you know, availability of resources and uh, the, the knowledge, the culture uh, was, was critical. So I literally ended up being in the lab recording animals, cats, at that time, my, my second week of medical school, and I never left. I was hooked. Uh, but uh, a little, I knew from the beginning I studied medicine, but I never wanted to be a physician. I knew that I wanted to study the brain and do research. And very quickly then I focused on, on sleep and I never left. <laughs> um, so what are your hopes for sleep science in the next five years? Well, my personal hope is that we will uh, keep trying to prove this hypothesis right or wrong. I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's not true that I, it's the same if it's right or wrong, of course. I would rather be 
uh, be happier if you were right. But I think the most important thing is to be able to test it because the most difficult thing for a scientist is to end your career without knowing the answer. Yes or no, but at least you know the answer. And so I hope to, be, uh, to, be, to have enough time in my life uh, to get to the point in which I know it's right or wrong. Uh, and uh, as I say, there are now, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic time for uh, sleep research because we have the tools, not all of them, but many of them, to really realistically be able to do this. So to give you a very precise example, you know, until now, again, you can make uh, correlations, but uh, it has been impossible to follow in the same animal, the same synapses, literally, in an animal alive, before learning, after learning, before sleep, after sleep. Now it's possible. So we can really use uh, uh, tasks or behavior in which we know exactly which synapses are uh, involved and see literally what happened to them. If we are right, you know, they should get stronger and then we can follow literally those synapses, not just uh, you know, some synapses in the brain, but those that we know have been involved in learning and see what happens uh, during sleep. Because I mentioned you know, one possibility would be those ones are protected, that they don't go down in strength. Everybody else around, not literally involved in that day's learning, should instead go down. And, you know, it's very difficult to do, but um, it's possible. And this is only in the last uh, really few, few years. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, very I think welcome. your keynote is going to be a, a real highlight of the programme. That's all the time we have for today. Join us at su on Sunday at 10 a.m. as we speak to Martin van Kranendonk about the search for life on Mars. Remember to comment, like and share on all the KAUST social channels using the hashtag WEP2019. And from everyone here at KAUST, thanks for watching. <laughs>